welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I don't have a program, so it, it's going to be mostly up to you guys what we talk about. Um, so before you ask me any questions, uh, just a couple questions for you. Is there anybody in the audience that is um, hoping to learn something about drawing? Okay. So the rest of you are mostly just fans of comics in general or fans of my work. Um, so whatever you want to uh, hear about, just uh, get me started somewhere and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Any questions to start off with? So the computers have altered a lot of stuff and the market has changed because we used to be strictly monthly deadlines. Every comic uh, would come out once a month. They've experimented with having them come out every two weeks and now there's a lot of uh, like mini series that um, an artist will just work on uh, maybe two or three issues and then he's gone whereas we used to have the same artist on titles for years. So most of my career, um, you, it was a monthly book and you had a month to do your part uh, usually. So if I was uh, penciling a book, um, I'm not that speedy, I'm not that slow, but um, most of your average artist would do a page a day of pencils. Um, sometime, some days I would do two pages. If I was doing breakdowns, I could do as many as three maybe. Uh, but usually one or two pages just for pencils. And then if I'm inking, if it's uh, really easy pencils, I could, like Gene Colan, I thought was easy to ink. I could ink up to four pages a day of his things. Um, other pencilers, it would take me two days to ink a single page. So it really varies a lot in there. Um, I've even letter jobs before, and I could letter you know, several pages in a day. Not a whole issue, but I could probably letter an issue in four days, maybe. Um, so, you know, they would split it up and have somebody um, maybe inking some pages while I'm penciling, or I'd be inking somebody else's pages while they're still penciling. Um, generally, we all try to do a page a day. Then there'd be guys like John Buscema and his brother Sal could do four or five pages a day of breakdowns. Um, you know, we get paid by the page, so the more pages you do, the more money you make. So we'd all try to, you know, crank out pages, but then again, um, some artists are more into storytelling, like John Musema, and I was more into the actual drawing. Um, so I didn't want to knock out pages, even though I would make more money. I, I just wanted to enjoy the drawing and um, kind of do the best job I, I could on each page. So I didn't really like doing just breakdowns, even though I did a lot of them. I did breakdowns on Superman and Star Wars. Breakdowns are just basically loose pencils uh, with no rendering and no blacks. It varies by the artist. So some, like John Simmons' breakdowns, were little marks that didn't even connect. So you really had to know how to draw to ink his breakdowns. Whereas someone like Mike Golden's breakdowns um, were just line drawings with no line weights and no details and no blacks, but very nice line drawings. My own breakdowns uh, kind of uh, somewhere in the middle of those two. I would, I would draw a little sketchier than Mike Golden. He would light box his. So, you know, his original drawings might be sketchy, but then he would make them very clean. Um, I would draw right on the page, and so you could see my underdrawing there, but they were basically all the drawing was there. You just needed to start rendering and, and adding blacks and stuff. Yeah. What is this? McLeod. Bob <laughs> McLeod. <laughs> Where do you normally have to be to, to do comics? 
You can be in your own living room. We're all living around the world now. There's no one place. Um, when I started out, I had to move to New York to get my career started. But you don't have to do that anymore. You can be where every, everything's done online now over the internet. So they used to actually print from our original art. They don't even do that anymore. They print from a uh, digital file that you scan in your art and send them a digital file. So you can be anywhere in the world, which again, has is, is really affected the look of the comics and, and our business because now we're competing with artists all around the world where we used to be competing with wh whatever artists could make it to New York. You know, so it's much more competitive than it used to be, which doesn't mean the art's much more, much better than it used to be uh, because if you were a good artist, you went to New York in the old days. So, you know, it's, it's a little rougher on us, but I don't know that it's made comics any better. Who's your, uh, do you have a favorite writer that you've worked with? Um, not really. I liked the job that I did with Peter David on um, The Commuter Cometh, one of my Spider-Man jobs. I'm basically a humor artist. I started out wanting to be an artist for Mad Magazine and draw movie satires. I was a huge Mort Drucker fan and uh, really thought that was going to be my career. And then when I got into business, um, I realized there wasn't steady enough work at that to make a good living, so I needed to teach myself how to do dramatic comics and learn visual storytelling and, and all that stuff. Um, but The Commuter Cometh, that issue with Peter David, was a funny story about Spider-Man going out in the suburbs and not having any place, any tall buildings to swing around from. Uh, so we had a lot of fun with that, and um, I, I thought he, he did a good job uh, giving me some scenes to have fun with. There's a scene at the very beginning where he's uh, still in the city, making his way to the suburbs, and he's swinging around on the rooftops, and there's some girls, you know, scantily clad, uh, sun, sunning themselves on a rooftop. You know, all, all kind of situations that I could have fun with in the story. Yes. Depends on your definition of graphic novel. I did a, uh, one of the first Marvel graphic novels, number four, was The New Mutants. Um, I don't call it a graphic novel myself, but they did. I think it's just a long comic book. I really think there's a difference between comics and graphic novels. Graphic novels sh should really uh, have more depth to the story. It shouldn't just be Spider-Man swinging around fighting each fighting other guys. It should, it should have some depth to the writing and um, really be longer than 50 pages, which is what mine was. I think 100 pages is more probably a minimum for a graphic novel. Um, but Marvel was starting up their graphic novel line when we came out with The New Mutants. It was going to be a regular comic, and then they said, well, we're looking for projects to turn into graphic novels. And so that was uh, one of their first graphic novels. Um, so it was good for me, but it's not really what I consider a graphic novel. I would like to do one, but it's a lot of work doing a graphic novel. And I've, you know, it, everything like that, other than the regular uh, comics work, you kind of have to make time for. And I just have been busy doing other things and haven't gotten around to looking for a project that I would want to make a graphic novel out of. So may, might still do one, but not yet. Um, you mentioned The New Mutants. I was a big fan of that book when it started out. Uh, how involved were you in the actual character concepts visually of how they were going to look, you know, in terms of, you know, you had Sunspot yeah. and Cannonball and Wolfsbane and their, you know, when their powers were active visually and what did you think or had you kept up with the way those characters have changed visually over the years? Well, Chris and Louise Simonson, Chris Claremont and Louise Simonson had uh, already decided to do the book, and Chris had some names of the uh, characters in his mind, um, some of their powers in his mind, um, all that before they ever brought me on board. So. They had the idea that they wanted to do a younger team of X-Men and make it more multinational, um, 
uh, more ethnic, and um, they needed someone to, to visualize that. And I had just done an issue of the X-Men, number 152, that they liked. And the previous X-Men artist might have been uh, Dave Cockrum, I forget who was the artist at that time, had just left the book, so they needed a new artist on the X-Men, and they offered me that because they liked the job I did. But then they said, we're also doing this spinoff, um, and you could be the co-creator on that. You know, I couldn't turn that down, so I, I took that. Um, they, di they didn't even have a title for the book, so the three of us kind of discussed what we wanted to call the book, and I think it was probably Louise that uh, suggested the New Mutants. You know, the original title of the X-Men was gonna be the Mutants, and um, they ended up calling that the X-Men, so we thought, well, the New Mutants. I never liked that title. <laughs> if it had been up to me, I would have chosen something else. I thought that was just kind of too generic, um, but that's what we went with. It was my idea to put more girls on the team than guys. Up to that point, every superhero team had had more guys than girls, uh, and I like drawing girls. So I said, let's put some more girls this time, and Chris went along with that. Um, he really had no firm ideas of what they should look like, so I, do, I went through adding a lot of uh, doing a lot of sketches of what the characters might look like. Uh, like Sunspot was originally gonna grow big like the Hulk when he used his powers, and we decided there's already a Hulk, we don't need to do that. So he ended up uh, staying small and having the little sun dots around him. Um, working out what Wolfsbane was gonna look like, uh, went through some changes. Um, Sam was gonna be real muscular at first, Cannonball. And uh, so I did some catches like that and uh, different ways he might look and, and Danny. And then we had to decide were they gonna have individual costumes or school uniforms. Uh, so I did some sketches for all that kind of stuff. So there were still a lot of decisions to be made um, and nailing down exactly what they were gonna look like. Um, you know, it was pretty much all mine. Um, trying to remember if Chris had suggestions, but I think he pretty much just left it up to me what they were gonna look like. And I wanted them to look like you and me instead of perfect people like Superman and Wonder Woman. You know, I wanted them to be normal kids who suddenly found out they had superpowers. And so I made them deliberately not look like movie stars. And then one of the first criticisms of the book was, boy, these are the homeliest looking superheroes. <laughs> But I think, you know, in the long run, it, it, was, it was better that I did that. After I left the book, you know, different artists have different influence and different things they want to do with their art. So they immediately went to being good looking after I left the book and, and more stereotypical. And um, I've seen many series of the New Mutants where Cannonball and Sunspot are the same height. You know, Sam's supposed to be like 6'1 or something. And, and uh, Roberto's supposed to be maybe five, six. What are you gonna do? <laughs> I, I tried to give different body types to each one of them, because like I say, I grew up uh, reading Mad Magazine, doing caricatures, and Mort Drucker would caricaturize somebody's whole body, not just their face. So I like drawing individual people. It's more fun for me to draw you know, people like us than Superman. So I drew Danny kind of tall and lean and athletic looking, and I made uh, uh, Rain Sinclair kind of busty and, and uh, uh, short and full-figured. Um, she was supposed to be kind of, in the beginning, I don't know what they did with her later, but she was supposed to be originally kind of um, very religious, and um, I thought given her a full figure, maybe she'd be embarrassed by having that full figure and contribute to things Chris could do with her her storyline, um, just stuff like that. But after I left the book, and I left because that was my first regular penciling assignment. I, I had already been inking for a few years, but I'd been penciling all along, but I'd been working on my storytelling and uh, my learning how to do dramatic comics. And there's a lot to learn in there, posing figures and you know close-ups and long, all that stuff. And 
we just started out, I was going to have all the time in the world to do the New Mutants until it became a graphic novel, and then that had a schedule, and we were already late on that schedule. So I had to rush through that as fast as I could draw and, and able to be able to ink the graphic novel. I had to actually work through my honeymoon on the inking on that. Um, and then rushed right into the first issue, second issue, third issue. And I didn't like uh, the inking I was getting. The inker was a new inker, not very experienced. And because my pencils were so rushed, it was, I was making it difficult for him to ink. Um, I really wanted to ink it myself. So I just wasn't happy with the way the work looked. I was rushed. I, so that's why I switched over to inking the book for a while. I thought I could control the look of the book better if I was inking. And they got Sal Buscema to pencil breakdowns for me. Um, but he was, like I was saying, doing th three or four books a month. And when you're doing that many books a month, you don't have time to think about your storytelling that much. So he was kind of just doing it. Um, you know, I always did a nice job, but without really thinking, well, maybe a close-up would look better here. Or maybe this should be a long shot, whatever. So a lot of medium shots, which are kind of boring to read and boring to draw and boring to ink. So I just got tired of that and, and ended up leaving the book. And after I left, I, I pretty much didn't want to know what they were doing. <laughs> I'm, I just moved on, basically. I mean, I saw what Bill Sienkiewicz was doing when he came on, and that was so radically different from what I did. Um, most people either hated it or loved it or, you know, a lot of mixed feelings. Um, there were things I liked about it and things I didn't like about it. I, you know, I think Bill's a great artist. I really love his color work, uh, particularly. Um, but I, I would look. I took a look at what he was doing, but I didn't really follow it after that. So I, I really have no idea what they did, what they did for those hundred issues. I didn't read them. Yeah. I don't think you need to. You know, I get that question pretty much everywhere I go. It makes me curious. Um, are there artists that really got in the business because they wanted to draw Batman or whatever? I mean, probably. Um, with me, it was more about just drawing. I just like to draw people. And um, I don't care who the character is, really. Spider-Man's kind of fun because he gets in these different poses, you know, the Superman's not going to get into. Um, so I, I always enjoy drawing Spider-Man. I like drawing Superman because he was the main comic I read as a kid. I was mostly in a Mad Magazine, but I, w I did read Superman comics, and my sister read Archie's, and then we'd swap, so I read a lot of Archie and, and Superman. So it was a big thrill to be able to actually pencil Superman for a couple years when that finally came along. But I just like to draw, so I don't really care who I'm drawing. About anybody else? Oh, sure. Mort Drucker, as I said, was my huge influence. Um, I can do a really good Mort Drucker uh, ripoff, but I really thought my work was uh, too much like Mort Drucker's, so I never even tried to get work at Mad Magazine. I did a lot of work for Crazy, Marvel's Crazy Magazine, their version of Mad Magazine. Um, drawing very much like uh, Drucker, but um, after him, when I decided to learn dramatic comics, I just said, well, at that time, in the 70s, John Buscema and Neil Adams, I thought, were the top two artists in the business, so I just studied their work a lot. Um, I, s I studied pretty much everybody at that time, really. Why just study one person? And I not only would study Neil, I would look at, well, where did Neil learn all this stuff? And he learned a lot from Stan Drake that did the newspaper strip, Heart of Julia Jones. And then I said, well, where did Stan Drake learn it from? And, you know, where did John Buscema originally studied Hal Foster? And where did Hal Foster get everything? And so I just kept going back and studying everybody I could. But I would say Neil and uh, John Buscema were my two main people, uh, Tom Palmer, a lot for inking. He was my favorite inker, so I studied his inking a lot. 
Um, I studied them for different things too. Neil, I really liked the surface of Neil, how he would render everything, where he would put rendering, what kind of rendering, um, but not his, not the way he draws, not his poses, not his storytelling. Um, more all about the surface of Neil's art. And then John Buscema, just the opposite. I liked his poses, the way he drew figures, um, his storytelling. Um, you know, so I, I picked up, everybody I looked at, I try to find something else in them. And you just take what you like and discard what you don't like and pretty soon it all becomes a blend that becomes your own style. So I still see a lot of more Drucker in my uh, superhero work. I don't know if other people do or not. And then later on, I, I was influenced by the European artist. <coughs> Excuse me. When I noticed um, some of they they started reprinting some of that stuff over in the U.S. A lot of the European cartoonists. Uh, there was one uh, Lieutenant Blueberry series by Jean Giraud, whose alias is Mobius. So I was very influenced by his work. Um, some of the other European artists um, whose names are escaping me at the moment. Uh, but like I said, I have so many influences. I always felt like my style was not all that distinctive um, because I had so many different influences. I knew you know, 20 different ways to do something. So it was kind of hard just to say, well, I'm always gonna do it this way. So I, I don't really ink the same way all the time. In my mind, I'm, I'm always doing something different. I'm kind of, from what other people have told me, I'm kind of known as a real clean inker. Um, that's, the, that's the most, that's the adjective mostly used to describe my inks, um, it was just clean. And I can see that, um, but I can also get pretty sketchy and, and rough too. Um, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else? Yep. I know sometimes artists occasionally use models in their work. Uh, I mean, the models are helpful in it. But I'm assuming most of the time, either for extended time, you can't do that. You just work up to the point where you can still be doing figures without the reference. Yeah, it'd be great. If, if I could have you model for me every time I wanted to draw somebody, um, but you don't have the time and you don't have the money. So basically we just memorize what the figure looks like in every position, you know, so you can hold out your arm and, and just learn what it looks like there. What happens when you turn it, you know, how does it look different? What's the back look like? What happens when you bend your elbow? Like I notice a lot of artists will put this elbow down here when their arm is bent. I've just memorized uh, by looking at a lot of figures and people, you know, everywhere I go, I just study people. Uh, I think people are really interesting to look at. I people watch a lot. And so I've just memorized what the figure looks like pretty much in every position. Um, you know, some positions are harder to draw than others because the back muscles do all kinds of tricky stuff. There's a lot of muscles that I know, but then you don't see them all in every pose. Um, so that's the tricky part. The muscles change um, person to person sometimes. You know, depending how developed your muscles are, male or female. Um, so it, it just, you know, it can get tough. But basically, we yeah, we just memorize. We have to, to, to turn out that number of pages. You know, you can't be stopping. Uh, and I'm one of the people that, um, pays more attention to anatomy than some other comic artists and try to do correct anatomy as, as much as I know it to be. Um, some artists uh, aren't that concerned with it. They, they have more of a stereotypical uh, sense of anatomy, like John Byrne. I love John's art. I think he's a, a wonderful comic book artist. But his anatomy is very, very much just a formulaic uh, comic book anatomy. It's not real people. Um, Sal Bissima, kind of the same thing. Sal and John are, are good examples because Sal's doing very stereotypical anatomy 
John is, is more realistic anatomy, even though he uh, changes things to make it work better for superheroes and for Conan, um, he's much closer to real people than his brother. And I, I very influenced by John, so you know I'm in that direction. And Neil, Neil of course knows every muscle in the body very well, and uh, I picked up a lot of my anatomy from Neil. I really prefer to ink my own pencils, well. but <laughs> yeah. But um, I love the art of inking. I had a great time inking so many different pencilers. Each penciler presents different challenges. It's totally different inking Gene Colan than it is inking John Buscema, than in inking my own pencils. Um, so inking is a wonderful art, or at least it used to be. It's totally changing now with digital coloring. Um, gets to be more and more about outlining with the full range of values you can get with color now. Um, but you know, my style of ink in the old, the older Silver Age style where we actually needed to do rendering to show a gradation from dark to light, um, it's so much fun to do. I, I spent years mastering the brush and the Croquel pen um, and I wanna use what I know. So when I do my art, I don't wanna just do outlining, I wanna do some rendering um, so I love doing that, um, but when you just do inking, it's kind of an empty way to go. I, I can't understand artists that just want to be inkers, that their whole goal is just to be an inker. I mean, to me it was just part of being an artist. I, I wanted to be a good inker, but I never just considered just being nothing but an inker. So I'm better known as an inker because I started out um, when I was in production, I started out my career in the production department at Marvel. My first job was actually taping the page numbers to the pages. So I, I started pretty much at the bottom and had to work my way up. Um, where was I going? When I, when I started in production, Mike Esposito um, looked at my, what I was, I, you know, showing my samples around the Marvel office trying to get work. And he said, you know, you could learn to be an inker faster than you can learn to be a penciler. I said, okay, I'll, I'll give Inkin a shot. So I started doing backgrounds for Mike Esposito and Al Milgram and Klaus Janssen, and then soon started getting my own ink work. Um, paid pretty well, I, I, it came easily to me. Um, so I just started doing a lot of inking, but all that while, I was still penciling for Crazy Magazine, and I did a couple pencil and ink jobs for Gold Key Comics. Um, I was still working on my penciling all those years that I was uh, mainly an inker. Um, like the first five, six, seven years of my career, I did mostly inking. Um, but I was constantly working on my penciling and, um, you know, really preferred to do the pencils and the inks. And I never really found an inker that I was happy with inking over my pencils because I'm not one of those stereotypical pencilers. And so if an inker doesn't really understand anatomy, he doesn't quite know how to interpret my pencils. Um, and because I've come out of that Mad Magazine school, my faces aren't your average comic book hero faces. So, um, you know, they just have trouble with my pencils. So I never really, even my favorite inker, Tom Palmer, he did some stuff that amazed me and then other stuff um, that I just, didn't like the changes he made on my pencils. So I'd always much rather pencil ink my own stuff. I'm sorry, you get a question over here? Was anybody else penciling with me? How do you exactly mean that? When? <laughs> um. I mean, no, we, we, I never, as an assistant, you mean, or something? Uh, no, I never used penciling assistants. Well, one, one time, my very first color comic that I inked over John Buscema, I was unprepared 
to ink something that empty that required so much work from the inker. It was breakdowns on Kazar, number seven, if anybody wants to look it up. It was a horrible job. Um, but it, they were in a rush, a hurry for it, and the only reason I got it was because nobody else was around to take it, and I said, I'll take that. And so they gave it to me reluctantly, and I got um, Joe Rubenstein was hanging around Neil Adams Continuity Studios at the time, where I had a studio there with Neil. And um, I got Joe to tighten up some of John Buscema's drawings before I inked them, some of the figures. But other than that, I always did my own, everything about my own pencils. Uh, sometimes I would use assistants to ink. I would have somebody ink the panel borders and um, fill in blacks and John Beatty, uh, another inker, when he was starting out, did some backgrounds for me. Not very many, but a, a little bit. Um, but 90, you know, 99% of my career, it's, it's just been all me, for good or ill. I don't know. Yeah. You know, this is a job, so it's not, for me, a matter of being inspired or getting in the right mindset. Um, I'm given a job and I have to do the job. I'm a commercial artist. If I was a fine artist and, and wanted to do only what I wanted to do and hope to sell it to somebody, it's totally different. But as a commercial artist, you just they give you an assignment and you have to do it by a certain amount of time, and you don't have time to wait and try to get inspired or whatever. You just get up and go to work. So you just have to get yourself in that mindset. And what I do if I just totally am blanking is I'll just look at what other people have done, try to get some ideas from what other people have done, either with drawing or writing or uh, character creation or, or whatever it is. Which was? Yeah, I mean, it's great. I tell my students, I teach part-time at the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, and I tell my students, go out and look at what other artists are doing, because to, to me it seems like most of them are too, uh, too much, uh, they, they haven't been exposed to enough other artists. And like I say, most of my uh, art style came from studying what every other artist I could find was doing. So I really think the more artists you look at, uh, the more it opens your mind to the possibilities of what you might be able to do and um, gives you ideas. You know, like I would get ideas from something that Neil did that he didn't actually do, but because he did one thing, it would give me an idea to do a different thing, maybe similar. Um, so you get a lot of ideas just from looking at what other people have done. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I think that varies quite a bit. In my experience, almost none. Um, usually the writer was in one place, I was in another place, we never got together. Um, same thing with pencilers and inkers, no interaction, or very little. I mean, I was friends with Mike Zeck, so he and I would uh, talk a little bit. But writers um, and artists, Chris Claremont and I on The New Mutants when we were starting out talked a lot. Um, but then after the graphic novel, he just sent me the plot and I did the pencils and that was that. There are some writers who um, really have a firm idea of, of what they're trying to do and they want to make sure the artist is in sync with that. And so I've heard of that happening, but I don't have a lot of experience with it myself. They really, the editors, pencilers, writers, inkers, every, everybody I've ever worked with pretty much um, you know, left it up to my own devices. The, the pencilers I've inked over, I just did them the way I wanted to ink them, not, be, not the way they wanted me to ink them. Um, 
my philosophy with inking was always um, just try to make the art look as good as I could make it look, not try to be as faithful to the pencils as I could. Um, same thing with when I was writing, when I was penciling uh, Chris's uh, scripts on or his plots on the New Mutants, I wasn't trying to necessarily draw it the way Chris might have envisioned it. I, d I just had this story and I said, okay, you know, how much can I get on this page? Where should I start the next page? How many panels do I think this should take? What would be a good uh, close big panel? What would be a good smaller panel, long panel, short panel, whatever? I just made all those decisions on my own. And um, if people didn't like what I was doing, I never heard about it. So maybe I was rubbing some pencilers the wrong way. Maybe some writers didn't like what I did or, or vice versa. But I, I never got any complaints. Um, so if they were unhappy, they were unhappy behind my back, which is fine, because um, I had a good career and got a lot of compliments too. So maybe some people weren't happy, but a lot of people were happy, so it worked out. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, I really like Jim Aparo's uh, early Brave and Bold work. I would have really enjoyed inking uh, Jim Aparo. I did ink him on half of an issue of Batman late, late in, his, in his career, like in the last year or two of his life. Very different style than that he was penciling, um, but I thought I did a good job on it. I used a lot of brush, even though he was a pen inker. Um, I, I was pretty happy with that, but it wasn't the Jim Aparo that I would have liked to have inked, really. Um, who else? Of course, Joe Kubert. Very few chances to ink Joe Kubert for anybody. He would have been interesting to ink. I, I basically just liked inking pencilers who knew figure drawing, who actually knew what a figure was supposed to look like. Because um, there's a lot of a lot of comic artists that just didn't draw figures that well. Um, no, <laughs> no. I I think Rob has actually gotten better. He gets a lot of hard knocks, but he's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, his anatomy I wouldn't say is his strength. Um, you know, we all have different strengths and weaknesses, and. Um, He's got things that fans like about his work, just like everybody else. Um, but anatomy, I don't think, is one of them. When I was inking, when I was penciling Superman, I got Brett Breeding doing my inks. And Brett's a super inker. He was one of my favorite inkers, and I was really excited that he'd be inking my pencils. But then once he started, I realized that he's an inker and doesn't know penciling. He doesn't know how to draw. I mean, at least not how to draw comics. And so when I would draw Lois Lane, he would kind of square off her jaw and make her look like a transsexual. You know? <laughs> he, he, he just hardened up my figures, uh, which in some cases made them look better, but on my women kind of made them look worse. Um, you know, so as good as an inker, might be if they don't really know figure drawing, it really makes a difference. And with m the way I pencil, uh, the inker really has to know figure drawing to do a decent job on my pencils at least. Anybody else? On repeating the same image, or on working I digitally, or yeah, yeah, um, I wouldn't do that. I'm not ethically opposed to it. I just think it 
makes the art less interesting to say the same image twice. Um, I'm trying to remember if I've ever copied a drawing, you know, to use the exact same drawing. I must have somewhere sometime. You know, in the old days we used to just Xerox or Lightbox the same drawing again. Um, I'd rather, I'd rather just draw a new figure. If I'm that pressed for time, I don't want to do the job really. I, if, you know, if I don't have enough time to just quickly, and I can do it pretty quickly, draw another figure, I'd rather not do the job. Um, also, just for storytelling reasons, I just think I think it makes a better, a more visually appealing job to to have new drawings in each panel instead of repeating the image. So I've seen it done well. I'm not saying it can't be done well, it's just not what I would want to do. There's um, a lot of changes that come about by digital uh, art. Inking, the style of inking, in fact inking in general is going away, I'm afraid. Um, the whole look of the art is changing you know, so, some things are better, but I think we're losing a lot of, of really good stuff because of uh, digital comics. But what are you going to do? You know, it's, it's the way of the world. You guys know that there's going to be a New Mutants movie? Has everybody heard about that? There actually, it's in the works. The script's already been written. Uh, Josh Boone is going to be the director. Um, I just signed a contract, a new contract with Marvel where they've already given me an advance uh, on the movie coming out. So they must believe it's coming out. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited to see what they're gonna do with the movie, I can't wait. Um, I'm really hoping that they cast young unknowns as the New Mutants rather than older star actors. Um, what's her name? Ellie Fanning? How old is she now even? She's probably in her 20s already. <laughs> I don't know. They, they grow pretty fast, but um, there's got to be some talented young actors out there that they could cast in the roles. And I'm hoping to actually get a Native American for Danny, you know, and, uh, instead of a white actor. You just never know what Hollywood's going to do. But I've enjoyed what they did with the X-Men movies for the most part, so I'm optimistic. I think it's going to, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be a great movie. So I'm really looking Maybe forward to that. actually paid a creator for something. <laughs> the, 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 the two comic giants aren't known for that here. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not getting millions. <laughs> no, they're, they're acknowledging you. That's more than... I'm hoping I'll at least... The old guys have gotten. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, the, it's horrible, the treatment so many artists have gotten in the past. Um, and if you're not careful still today, but um, I'm hoping I'll at least get a screen credit. Um, a lot of people have asked me if, if they've contacted me to have in, any kind of involvement with the movie, and I'd be flabbergasted if they actually did that. You know, um, It'd be wonderful if I could just have a little walk-on role in the background. But I don't foresee any of that happening. Um, but I just signed a contract with Marvel where I do get um, a fee for every theatrical production that they might do with my uh, characters from the New Mutants. Um, so yeah, it's it's gonna. I can't wait to see what they're gonna do. It's still a couple years away. Bob, I got one last question for you. Sure. Might we look forward to seeing you back next year? <laughs> yeah, be happy to come back. I really enjoy Lexington. Um, this was my first experience in Lexington tasting um, bourbon beer. Anybody ever tasted bourbon beer? That's my favorite beer now. So um, I have a soft spot for Lexington just for that reason. But everything I know about Lexington, it's, it's a fun place, and I'm always happy to come here. Um, so I'll come whenever they invite me. So be happy to come back next year. There you go. Yeah. There you go. I would love to, yeah. 
Most of the times when I go to conventions, I'm in and out so quick like this time. I came in Friday night, and I'm leaving Sunday afternoon. So I don't get a big chance to really see the city and get around and, and enjoy the areas too much. Sometimes I do, uh, but, but not usually, unfortunately. It's work. Um, my wife has come to a couple, a few shows with me in, in various places, but... Um, you know, even if she came, I, I'm working most of the time, so it doesn't make much sense for her to come because we can't spend time together. So it's a job. You know, as much as I love coming to conventions, it, it's a work weekend. What's your booth number, Bob? 57? My booth number is, yeah. is 57, I 57. believe. 57. Don't forget to go see Bob at his booth, guys. Booth, booth number 57. Let's give him a warm Kentucky welcome. Let's send him off right, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. If you guys can just clear the room, we're going to clear the room and make a line outside if you're, uh, if you're here for the next panel. But go ahead and clear the room. Thank you.